You know, I've been showing off Maya on this channel for about two and a half years at this point, and I think it's high time that we do an Aspidites care guide. This is going to focus on black-headed pythons, but most of the information applies to Womas as well. I just don't have any Womas. I do have a new snake in the green room, though, that you haven't seen yet. Unless you're a member of the Horde of Keepers over on Patreon, then you saw him a few months ago. Uh, but it's appropriate for me to introduce him on this particular video. Guess what kind of snake he is? Kilimanjaro Death Strangler? What? No, it's not a Kilimanjaro Death Strangler. That's not a real thing. You've never been to Kilimanjaro, so you would have no way of knowing. Kent, it's my little male black-headed python. Exactly what a Death Strangler looks like. This is Banjo. He's a nine-month-old black-headed python, and he will be Maya's boyfriend when he gets closer to adult size. I got him from my friend Mike Roscoe over at the reptile shop. And when I saw this dark black back that's close to Maya's, not quite as dark as Maya's, but almost, I knew that I had to have him. By the way, my YouTube stats are telling me that there's a lot of people that are watching this channel without being subscribed. And it helps the channel if you're subscribed. So if you could do me a favor and just hit that subscribe button, that would be helpful. And then if you decide that you like this video, hammering that like button is helpful as well. Okay, care guide. Now, I mentioned that this is going to apply to black-headed pythons, and most of the information will apply to womas as well. Uh, womas and blackheads are the two species that make up the entire Aspidites genus. These are very unique pythons compared to all the other pythons, but very similar to one another. The main difference is black-headed pythons get quite a bit bigger. They can get up to 10 feet maybe larger, depending on how aggressively you're feeding them. And Womas are around six to seven feet. That's a pretty substantial difference. Right now, Maya, I'll get her back out, you'll see her later, but Maya is a six foot snake right now. So she's about the size of an adult Woma. I've heard some people say that Woma pythons are more food aggressive and more likely to bite you. I've heard the same amount of black headed, of people saying that black headed pythons are more food aggressive and more likely to bite you. Uh, I think it just depends on the individual keeper's experience with their particular snakes. I'm going to split the difference and say that both species are highly food motivated and not necessarily likely to bite you. It depends on the individual and their body language is pretty easy to read. So if you have one that gets confused about food, uh, you can learn their body language. And then you're less likely to get bit as long as you're paying attention, but we'll talk more about that later. So in figuring out the basic parameters for Aspidites, it's best to look at their natural history. So here's Australia, and black-headed pythons inhabit the northern part of Australia, this, this blackened area here. And there's a number of different regions in that area. There's uh, tropical, humid rainforests, grasslands, and semi-arid scrublands. And then the Woma pythons are in this blue area here in the, in the central, and that's more grasslands to desert. Wide range of humidity though, especially for the black-headed python, there's a pretty big range. I don't worry too much about humidity for my black-headed pythons. They always have good sheds, and I've never done anything to bump or lower their humidity, except that I keep them on Aspen, which keeps the humidity a little bit lower. And in this room, it keeps it to 50 to 60%. For some of you, that might keep it too low, putting, putting them on Aspen, but it works for me. All those areas in Australia get pretty hot, and you'll find that Aspidites keepers have different parameters that they keep their individual snakes at. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you what I do, and I'll say that they do well. These are really hardy snakes, so if you choose to do something a little bit different than what I'm doing, it's gonna be fine. It's, it's best to figure out what your individual snake wants. So here's what I do, and I'll tell you how I figured it out. So I keep both Banjo and Maya at a 90 degree hotspot, and their cool side gets down to about 84. I know a lot of people that keep their snakes, their black-headed pythons, at like 95 degree hotspot. Uh, the cool spot can get down into the 70s, you know, high 70s, something like that. The snakes do just fine, either way. The reason that I keep Banjo and Maya both at those temperatures is that they both prefer to be right around 86. Neither one of them ever bask in their 90 degree hotspot, even when they're digesting meals, but I wanna provide it to them because they'll crawl through it, I guess a little bit. Uh, but they digest at about 86 degrees. And a lot of times when they're just sitting there, they're on their cooler side. Now, if I noticed that they were always on their warm side, I'd bump those temps up. 
if I noticed that they were always on their cool side, I would keep it, I, I bring it down, bring the temps down a little bit. But since they both hang out kind of in that mid range of 86, 87 degrees, then I feel like I'm good with, with the 90 degree hotspot at this point. They also both always have great sheds. I don't need to put a humid hide in there. I've heard of other keepers spraying off their black headed pythons. I've heard, I heard somebody say that their black headed pythons really enjoy being sprayed off. I've never done that with mine. Um, but again, you can treat them a little bit differently. You know, you figure out what your individual snakes like and, uh, you know, do, do what seems to work for them. So both of the snakes are going between about 87 and 83 degrees, something like that most of the time. Those are my individual snakes though. You may find something different. So if you've got a snake that's hanging out on the hot end all the time, lower your temps a little bit. I mean, no, raise your temps a little bit. Uh, if they're hanging out on the cold end all the time, lower your temps a little bit. So you just need to adjust accordingly depending on your snake. Uh, I said that I keep them on Aspen and I do that because I want them to uh, engage in that burrowing behavior. A lot of people keep black-headed pythons on paper. They do well on paper. I'm sure they would do well on cocoa husk as well. Uh, they just, they do fine in, in a lot, you know, a lot of different things. It's going to be really hard to kill a black-headed python or a Wilma python. So uh, figure out what your snakes like to do. Mine like to burrow in the aspen, so I give them a nice thick pile of it and uh, they kick it all over their cage. Let's talk about hides. Hides are important for any snake, but this is another area where you can do whatever is working for your particular black-headed python. With something like a ball python, I always say that you should have two snug fitting hides that are exactly the same. Ball python's number one priority is security, and that's the rule that works best for them. Uh, with a black-headed python, it's a little bit different. Their number one priority is food and uh, they're gonna interact with their hides differently depending on what stage of life they're in, what type of individual you have. Uh, so for example, Banjo is still young and he's not as confident. So he is using a hide anytime he's not roaming around his cage. So if he's gonna curl up somewhere, it'll definitely be in a hide. So I have multiple hides in there for him. I think I have four or five uh, laying around of different sizes. Plus he's got a cave on the side of his uh, enclosure and I usually have a paper towel roll in there. He uses all of them equally. He doesn't have a favorite hide, which is so weird to me because I think all my snakes have a favorite hide that they're in. Uh, he doesn't have a favorite. He just, wherever he happens to be in the cage, he finds a hide and crawls in there. Now Maya here is the apex predator of the green room and she knows it. At her size and experience, she has no fear of anything. So I used to have her in smaller hides that she can curl up and fit snugly in. In fact, they're these. She is six feet long and she can actually curl up in this hide. She never does though. She just uses them to crawl in and out of. So I ended up giving her bigger hides. She has the big jumbo black box hides now that give her more, more space to crawl in and out of because she's never spending any time curled up in a hide. When she curls up to go to sleep, it's right in the middle of the cage and she has hides if she wants to use them. When she's in shed, she'll curl up in a hide and that's her sky hide that she curls up in. But otherwise, it's a crawling around area for her. Let's talk about optional cage stuff as we scroll the horde of keepers over on patreon.com slash greenroompythons. These are the people that are helping out the channel and they're my favorite people because they allow me to do what I love. So as far as decor for your cage, put whatever you want in there because they'll interact with stuff. But I keep my cages a little bit sparse. I'm not filling it with tons of stuff because these snakes are moving all the time when they're awake. Uh, they in, in the wild, they get up, pop their black head out of a burrow, let the sun heat their head, their head acts like a solar panel, heats up their brain and the rest of their body, and then they're on the move hunting, like every day hunting. They'll go up to a mile a day cruising around uh, looking for other snakes and lizards to eat. So uh, I want my snakes to have the room to do that behavior. And again, security isn't their number one concern. 
Uh, you definitely want your snake to be secure, but you don't need to have all that clutter like you would for like a brand new baby ball python, which needs tons of clutter. Black-headed pythons don't need that as much. And special thanks to our channel sponsors, Black Box Cages, who provides all the cages and hides and everything here in the green room. Lane Labs for frozen feeders. They've got fantastic stuff. And the Royals Project, who's producing some amazing ball pythons this year. Check out those discount codes. Okay, hey, where are you going? You can't go in there. Maya, that's a tiny shelf. You can't get in there. Crazy. So not only do I give the snakes plenty of space within their cage to move, I also give them plenty of time outside their cage. Maya hunts all over the green room. When she's out of her cage, she's constantly moving. Never once in the two and a half years that I've had her has she ever curled up somewhere and gone to sleep when she's out of her cage. She's moving, moving, moving. And Banjo is too small to free roam in, in the green room, but he can have the, the playpen to roam around and, and get a little cruise time somewhere that's not his own cage. And I realize that most people are not set up to necessarily free roam their snakes, but because we know the black-headed python's natural history, that they're cruising around all day looking for food, they're active hunters. This is another thing that makes them different than other pythons. Most other pythons are ambush hunters. These guys are actively hunting all day, moving around. So because we know this, we can determine that bigger is better as far as cage size. You can prioritize floor space over height, even though they will climb around on things. Maya climbs up on stuff all the time. She's up on top of the rack. She'll go over the countertop. She'll come down, go up over the couch. This is kind of like her maybe climbing over rocky, uh, you know, outcroppings of, of rock or whatever. And by the way, when she's out hunting around, guess what brain mode she happens to be in? That's right, feeding mode. So I have to be careful with her when she's out cruising around the green room. When I go to pick her up, I usually use a hook so that she knows that it's a hook touching her, not food. We're gonna talk about feeding in a minute, but let me tell you how I avoid getting bit when she is in food mode. It's basically understanding their body language and then paying close attention to them. Sometimes I don't pay close attention to Maya and then I do get bit. But Derek Roddy, who is uh, one of the experts in the United States in black-headed pythons, he's been successfully keeping and breeding them longer than just about anybody in the country. Uh, he told me one time that black-headed pythons get super food aggressive once they turn about three years old. Well, Maya has been super food aggressive since she's been about a year and a half old. So I'm very used to what she looks like and how she acts when she's in food mode. Uh, and she's almost always in food mode. The only time she's not is if I'm holding her, she stays out of food mode. And if she's curiously exploring a new area. So if I take her outside, that's usually new enough for her. You know, I just put her down somewhere that she won't go into food mode because she's just curious about stuff. Or if I bring something new, like a new piece of furniture or something into the green room and she's exploring that, she stays out of food mode. Otherwise, if she's in her cage, almost always. Uh, if she's hunting around, she's almost always in, in food mode. So I use a hook with her. Now, if she's in her cage and I go to touch her body with my hand, she's they can feel the warmth of, of my hand and they can tell a, uh, a living thing touching them versus an inanimate ob object touching them. So if I touch her body, she arches her body really big and if you're used to other snakes, like let's say ball pythons, if you touch them and they arch their body, that's them saying, stop touching me. Don't, they're trying to push you away. But what she's doing is she thinks it's food and she's trying to pin my hand against the side of her cage or the top of her cage. And then she'll whip around with an open mouth. I don't think this is all black headed pythons, but Maya does it. She opens her mouth first and then whips around and whatever ends up in her teeth, she's gonna bite down on. But if I pay attention to that, I can easily avoid getting bit. She also will wrap her prey with her with the back of her tail. So if I touch the back of her tail, it'll whip around and wrap me up, kind of like the anaconda did to John Voigt in Anaconda, uh, which is pretty crazy behavior. If she wraps me up with the back of her tail, I can easily get out of there before she comes in with her teeth. It's not that big of a deal. Hey, don't go in my shirt, lady. Don't go in my shirt. Come on, come on, come on out. Thanks, appreciate that. Incidentally, Maya has never once given me defensive behavior. She's never uh, acted scared of me. She's never struck at me in defense, not even a bluff strike, which is kind of what black-headed pythons are known for, that they bluff strike. Even in the wild, 
if you come across a wild one and are messing with them, they'll give you bumps with their nose or maybe a bump with an open mouth without actually biting. Uh, and she's never done that to me. But this brings me to Banjo's behavior, which is kind of the opposite of Maya's right now. Now, Banjo here, being a little guy, he knows that he's not an apex predator and he is much more concerned about ending up on somebody's menu. And I don't blame him because I'm sure that he looks absolutely delicious to anything living in the Australian outback. So behaviorally, he is on the other side of the spectrum from Maya. He has never mistaken me for food. Uh, but on the other hand, he does startle easily. And when startled, he will uh, jump his coils at whatever he's startled at. My, it's been my hand in the past. I'm more careful with him now. But uh, he'll also bluff strike like crazy. He's never actually bitten me, but he's he'll bump me with his nose. I think he's used to me enough now, and I'm careful enough with him that he hasn't done that lately. But he does startle easily. But the other day, I was just walking by his cage, and it startled him. He was near the cage, and he started bumping the at the glass. So uh, he'll you know he'll gain more confidence as he gets older. But that is his personality right now, and that's kind of the personality of my individual snakes. Your experience might be very different depending on the snake you have and in what stage of life they're in. Now, let's look at the black-headed python's natural history again to figure out how we're going to feed these guys. In the wild, black-headed pythons are reptile specialists. Don't worry, you're not going to be just feeding them reptiles. But let's look at how they do this. They are, as I said, active hunters, which is very different than most pythons that you're used to. Uh, in the wild, they're getting up almost every day and they're out looking for food. They are successful at it too. This is not like a big reticulated python who grabs a meal, has to then wait a week or two weeks or whatever to digest that meal and then wait another week, two weeks, month or so before they're able to catch another meal. These guys are running around in an area where there are tons of reptiles and they've been tracked. They've tracked big black-headed pythons consuming up to 12 to 15 bearded dragons in a week. And this is like bearded dragons, blue tongue skinks, other snakes, venomous snakes, because they're immune to the venom of uh, the venomous snakes in the outback. So they're eating a lot of meals. Reptiles aren't as fatty or nutritionally dense as rodents are. So they're able to churn through those meals and just keep going. Their digestive system is getting through them quickly so they can just go find another one. They can eat mammals and birds as well in the wild. It's just that 90% of the animals out there are reptiles, so that's what they're mostly getting. Now, if they were eating that many mice and rats that often, they'd be about as thick as those obese power-fed retics that you see on that one guy's TikTok. So with that bit of natural history out of the way, let's talk about feeding them in captivity. Again, this is another thing that varies. Different people do it differently. Um, I would say that it used to be more common that people would power feed them and they would get big. You'd, you'd easily see the ones that are 10 feet plus and super thick, and they live about eight years. Uh, by the way, normal lifespan for these snakes is over 20 years, but a big power fed one might, you know, a female, let's say, might breed one season or two seasons for the people that are breeding them. Then they'll stop breeding and then they'll die of fatty liver disease, whatever. Don't power feed any of your snakes. But I think most, most keepers know not to do that now. And I think what, what most keepers are probably doing is feeding them on a normal schedule like you would any other python, you know, once a week, once every two weeks, something like that, depending on their size, and uh, giving them, figuring out the size of meal that they would get. Now, here's an issue with black-headed pythons and womas. Their little faces don't stretch as much as other uh, pythons do. So they don't... The, it's it's not good to feed them giant meals. Uh, so a lot of times what people will do is if they're going to, if they would normally feed their snake a medium rat, let's say, they'd split it up and feed them two smalls. So that seems to work well for them. You know, a snake like this uh, once a week and Maya would get fed every two to three weeks, I think, from those keepers. I do it a little bit differently though. Uh, I'm feeding these snakes more like they would be eating in the wild. This is something that Derek Roddy does and he told me about it and I decided to adopt this because it makes more sense given their natural history. So uh, what I'm doing is, uh, with, actually with Banjo here, he does get fed once a week until he's a little bit bigger. But with Maya, she gets fed every few days. She gets fed about every four days is what it ends up being, twice a week. Uh, so I figure out what I normally would feed her, which 
would be about, a, let's say, the equivalent of a medium rat for her. Uh, and then I split it up. But I'm not feeding them rodents mostly. I'm feeding them birds, so they, they get chicks, quail, they get iguana reptilinks. So re reptilinx makes a little whole prey iguana sausage uh, made from the entire iguana. So they are, they are getting some reptile. Uh, and then occasionally they get mice and rats. Banjo is too small for the size birds that I have in the freezer. So he gets uh, hopper mice and uh, reptilinks that are his size. I have, I have tiny iguana reptilinks that he eats also. So Maya is target trained and she knows that when she sees the blue reflector target, that means food's available. She comes over, touches it with her face or tongue flicks on it and she gets her food. But lately I've been giving what I think is a much better bit of enrichment for her rather than target training. I want her hunting to pay off. So on feeding day, oftentimes what I do is I'll take the, figure out what amount of food I'm gonna give her and I break it up into three prey items. That usually means either three one week old quail or three uh, sort of smaller reptilinks, iguana reptilinks, and I'll hide them around her cage. So what I do is I let her hunt around the green room for a couple hours before I feed her, and then I put her in her cage and place things around her cage and let her go and find them. Uh, I think that's much better for a black-headed python and a woma python. These snakes also, this is another thing that's different about them than other pythons, they eat carrion in the wild, so roadkill basically. If they come across a dead animal, they will just start eating it. That's just as good to them as catching something live. So uh, they have no problem with coming across a quail that's just laying on top of a hide or something and, and just eating it. So I think it's a good uh, bit of enrichment for them to do. I'm not even bothering with target training Banjo uh, because I've been feeding him like that. I just put a mouse or two mice or whatever uh, somewhere in his cage and he finds it. I also have a puzzle feeder that I used with Maya when she was younger, and then I put it up in the closet, and I haven't used it with Banjo yet, but I think I will. I think I'll start using the puzzle feeder because he's a good size, good size snake for that. So I think that's a good feeding enrichment idea for a snake like this who is used to eating dead animals in the wild. You know, their brain is wired that way that they're not picky about whether the animal happens to be alive or dead at the time that they find it. So aside from all the extra stuff that I do for these snakes, their basic care is pretty simple. And it's also really variable. And I know that's tough, like for, especially for a first time snake keeper that decides to get themselves a woma python or a blackhead uh, to say, well, you know, it could be this temperature or that temperature, or you've got a wide range of humidity levels. Uh, just, just pick one and see what works for your snake. Go mid range at first and see how your snake does. And, uh, and then they're super easy to keep. Again, it, you have to try really hard to kill one. I do recommend doing the extra enrichment though because these are very active, highly intelligent snakes and they'll display that intelligence for you if you allow them to do that. Now, for those of you who keep both Womas and Blackheaded Pythons, how did I do? Did I hit the mark? Are you, are you treating your Womas or Blackheads any differently other than maybe the size of things? Uh, let me know in the comments. And for those of you who don't keep black-headed pythons or Woma pythons, which one are you planning to get? Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.